In recent years, there's been a lot of scholarship and debate over the possibility that women were once priests or deacons or ordained in general in the Roman Catholic Church at some point in history, and that this liberatory possibility went away over time and many years and some mastermind scheme of women's oppression. And it's got a lot of pathos to it. I mean, to look at it through a Foucauldian lens, we want to believe that there was this time where women were much freer in the Catholic Church, where they had this great leadership opportunity. Why? Because we want to see if there's something that we can go back to. Is there something to fight for within the modern Catholic Church? Is it redeemable at all? And is there anything in the language of tradition, which the Roman Catholic Church speaks fluently, that we can grab onto and, and try to cause a resurgence of? I'll admit, these are the reasons that I started investigating this issue. I wanted to see, is there any real hope for the Catholic Church? One book in particular that kind of exemplifies the modern interest in this issue is When Women Were Priests by Karen Good. Jo Torgerson. I'm not sure if she or her publisher would categorize it as a popular history book, but the scope of time that it covers and the many different places that it visits and the fact that it's been read by so many different audiences kind of makes it popular history in my opinion, along with the strong agenda that undercurrents it. But now this is great because in theory it should make history more accessible, right? Like kind of what I'm doing right now. But with such a strong conclusion and a strong title, one must wonder, is it just our imagination? Was there ever really this magical period where women were able to serve at the altar, to consecrate the Eucharist? Were women actually able to be ordained as priests, deacons, anything? And how, if so, was this suppressed? These are the questions that were guiding my research and preparing for this video, and this is what I want to get into with you right now. Let's go. Now, before I present any evidence for ordained women, I want to be level with you. We have a lot of source problems. First of all, there was just not that many. There's only five extant sources of women bishops in Europe. It's period. You know, we got epigraphs on tombs, we got literary sources, that's it. Five. Of course, scholars have made the argument that this makes sense, given that the church was doing most of the record keeping. I mean, why would you want to preserve something that you don't want people to know exists? However, you know, we can't make an argument just based on the absence of something, so this does present a problem. Secondly, the sources that we do have are slim pickings and kind of confusing. Whether we have to assume the opposite of a diatribe against women serving at the altars, clearly if you didn't want them to do that badly, they probably served at the altars, or merely we see the feminized version of the word priest. But this could mean a priest's wife, or a female priest. Or maybe we assume, based on precedent and context, that when referring to a group of deacons in an ordination ceremony, this includes both men and women. So as you can see, there's a lot of assumptions that we have to make here. And this does not make everybody happy. It's been pretty easy for the church and many historians and theologians to kind of explain these assumptions away. It is worth getting curious about, however. We've got to see what Gary Macy, author of The Hidden History of Women's Ordination, calls an alternative scenario, glimpse through the cracks in the dominant story. Let's look at the evidence. Okay, so the first thing I want to present is the possibility that the definition of ordained that the Catholic Church uses today is not the same one that was used in the early church, say the 4th through 10th centuries in Western Europe. And that maybe because of this, we could say that trying to apply this definition to judge whether women in the early church were actually ordained or not is anachronistic. This is at least what Gary Macy argues in that book I just mentioned and a number of other scholars that I read. So how does the Catholic Church today define ordination? Well, they say ordination is a ceremony by which a man becomes either a priest, in which case he has to be celibate, a deacon, in which case he could be married, or a bishop, in which case he also has to be celibate. It's, um, it's a spiritual and transformative process by which the priest or deacon or bishop receives this sort of transformative power um, and authority that places him above the lay people or the regular people. And as mentioned before, these offices are only available to men. So there's this hierarchy that's presented, right, between priests and bishops and deacons, and there's even hierarchy 
among them. Um, but for all intents and purposes, they're up here. The lay people and all women are down here. Now in that book I just mentioned by Gary Macy, he argues that up until the 11th and 12th century, there was a very different definition of ordination that was much more expansive um, and much more localized. Um, he argues that it was a ceremony by which an individual would be appointed to some sort of ministry or ordo, or, or ordo would be the term in Latin, uh, within a specific church community. So it wasn't translatable necessarily among different churches, and it wasn't the bestowal of some mystical power, and it wasn't relegated only to priests or only to men. So this is a very different image of the church that we're looking at here, um, which is something that will be important as we go along. Now under this, there were quite a few leadership roles that women were able to have um, in the early church that were considered just as ordained as any that men would have. Um, you had widows, you had virgins, um, you had abbesses, and you also had, or there is evidence for, deaconesses, priestesses, and female bishops. However, the first few are beyond the intent of this particular essay, um, so we're just going to be looking at the ones that had male counterparts. Okay. But we still want to see whether or not this older definition of ordination applied to women. If not, then <laughs> maybe the Catholic Church was right all along. So, first off, let's look at ordos and ordination rites. As stated before, ordos were different ministries in the church that you could be appointed to, and there were a lot more of them than there are today. And many medieval scholars kept books of lists of ordos and ordination rites that we can still look at today. Women's orders would often appear right alongside men's, and sometimes different words were used like consecrate or blessing or the making of a monk or a nun, but these were used pretty interchangeably and all seemed to signify the same thing, ordination. Historians like Macy take this as an example of equality, or at least comparably ordained status of men and women in the early church. Similarly, books of ordination rites would list the ordination ceremony instructions for women right alongside those for men. Let me read you an example. This is from the Mozarabic liturgy, dating from the 7th through 11th centuries. Preface for ordaining a priest. Ritual for ordaining an archpriest. Ritual for ordaining an abbot. Blessing for a garment dedicated to God. Ritual for the blessing of a virgin. Ritual or blessing for a veiled woman dedicated to God. Ritual for ordaining an abbess. So the fact that this book includes rituals for ordaining a garment dedicated to God or a veiled woman right alongside rituals for priests implies that they are all the same amount of ordained and underscores the idea that ordination was much more expansive than it is today. Even more intriguing than these lists is the ordination rites and ceremonies and processes themselves, some of which we have copies of. With some of these rites, historians have had to infer, or have decided to infer, that they apply to both men and women, even if they only use masculine pronouns. Now this is based on the context. For example, if an ordination ceremony lists a prayer embedded in it, that has a section for both men and women, um, but the rest of the ceremony process does not have any sort of female pronouns, um, they infer that, okay, well this probably applied to both deaconesses and deacons, um, even though it doesn't specify as such. However, there are some that are explicitly for women. Not trying to put my opinion here, but it's pretty cool. So Macy quotes from this translation, when the bishop blesses the deaconess, he places the orarium, or stool, used for bishops, deacons, and priests, on her neck. However, when she proceeds to the church, she wears it around her neck so that both sides of the orarium are under her tunic. He goes on to describe how the deaconess then prostrates in front of the bishop and he recites a prayer, after which she takes the veil from the altar and places it on her own head. Finally, the deaconess accepts a ring and a crown from the bishop. Now, this source is kind of amazing, not gonna lie. Not only is the rite specified for a deaconess, which we know because of the feminized version of the word, as well as the emphasis on veiling and chastity within the prayers, but Macy suggests that this specific way of wearing the orarium was specific to deacons and priests when they were preaching. Preaching. This means this woman had an incredible leadership role within her church community. She was doing things that Paul the Apostle explicitly forbade women from doing and that many church fathers of this time would have condemned and did condemn. That this function of the deaconess was maybe specific to this 
source this community. However, kind of amazing that it did exist at all and makes you wonder about whether there are more examples out there like it. Okay, let's move on to the many, many contemporary arguments we have against women being ordained. What's that quote about history again, until the lions have their own historians? Yeah, well, unless the lions historians can figure out how to interpret a relative lack of evidence of their existence, historians will have to rely on the hunters' accounts. Lucky for us, the hunters, well, the church fathers, have provided extensive accounts of their frustration and hatred for the lions. Analogies aside, many of the most descriptive and telling literary sources that we have for women's ordination comes from people who forbade their existence. To go back to our good friend Macy, he makes the compelling argument that just because one of the church fathers, or even a council full of them, said that women shouldn't be priests doesn't mean that they weren't. Further, because the church was not even remotely an institution at this point, or something that could be traced to be the same across many different church communities, everything was pretty localized as discussed before, so doctrine might only apply to one specific community and not be the same for everywhere. And all this being said, it's pretty clear that when someone tells you that women can absolutely, under no circumstances, ever possibly serve at the altar, it's pretty clear that they were probably doing it. Let's get a feel for some of these sources. Here's a quote from a canon written by the deacon Fulgentus Ferrandus of Carthage from the 6th century. That it is not fitting for women who among the Greeks are called presbyterises, presbytery in Latin, and who among us are called widows or elders, once married and the enrolled, to be appointed as if ordained in the church. So there's not much background provided on this specific canon, at least in the sources I've looked at. Um, there's, it's pretty ambiguous. However, it was clear that there was an opinion in the Western Church that the idea of ordination was something that should be relegated to the East. It wasn't a here problem, or it shouldn't be. Further, there seems to be some sort of connection between women's priesthood and the idea of the order of widows, um, but that being an actual priest required an extra step of ordination that women who were widows did not necessarily have, which is very interesting. However, what this definitely tells us is that there was a lot of discourse and debate going on around the subject of women's ordination, and that there were likely women who were seen as ordained, uh, but that this was increasingly becoming a problem. Here's a quote from a synod or clerical assembly in 380 CE a little earlier, in Sargosa, Spain. Let all believing women who belong to the Catholic Church absent themselves from lectures and conventicles, clandestine meetings, of foreign men and from women giving lectures, either out of zeal for teaching or learning, since this is what the Apostle commands. And when they're saying that this is what the Apostle commands, they're referring to Paul um, and his many arguments against women teaching, women speaking aloud in the church, um, more information on that, you can go to 1 Timothy's and 1 Corinthians. According to Oziak and Madigan, in whose book I found this source, uh, the foreign men described here referred to Priscillianists, who were sort of similar to the Manichaeans, and um, basically they were heretics uh, in the eyes of the Catholic Church. But what is most important here is the fact that there were women who were lecturing, teaching, probably preaching, given the religious context of the apostle frowning upon them doing this, the quote does not mention ordination. I know that. It's possible that the women were ordained, however, what we can solidly say is that these women were certainly serving a religious function um, and a preaching function that seemed very, very disagreeable in the eyes of many church officials. Now, a large portion of the evidence that we do have for women ordained officials doesn't come from very descriptive literary sources. Most of it is inscriptions. So that could be epigraphs on a tomb, or maybe a mosaic of somebody. These are places where direct inference is difficult, and historians often have to rely on historical and literary context, or their own interpretations. Now, this last part can be a little bit tricky. Um, it can be easy to read a whole story into a simple scratch, which is what I think Torgerson does early on in her book. Let me read you a quote. Of a Roman basilica mosaic, she writes, 
A carefully lettered inscription identifies the face on the far left as Theodora Episcopa, which means Bishop Theodora. But the A on Theodora has been partially effaced by scratches along the glass, leading to the disturbing conclusion that attempts were made to deface the feminine ending, perhaps even in antiquity. Simple mistake could be a possibility, right? Nonetheless, these inscriptions are really important supplements to the few literary sources that we do have that can kind of show how pervasive uh, women ordained officials might have been, especially because they are much easier to preserve and have less of a chance of being willfully forgotten by record keepers than literary sources. So let's look at a couple very cool ones. This is an example of Maria Presbyteris. Uh, it was found in Gaul and it dates probably from like the fourth century and it reads, Martia, the Presbyteria, made the offering together with Olibrius and Nepos. Okay, <laughs> hello ambiguity. Not only did historians have to decide that the word used here, Presbyteria, instead of Presbytera, was actually a noun and not referring to the offering itself, but they also interpreted this offering, done by Presbyteris, as some sort of consecration of the Eucharist during the Mass which is one of the most important tasks of a priest today that distinguishes him from lay people. And they didn't just make this up, you know, they reference, they cross-referenced it with um, letters of councils that came up during this time period and relevant to this location, looked at the use of Presbyteria as a title in this time. Of course, we can't know for certain, but it's pretty strong evidence. Let's look at another example, the example of Anna the Deaconess, or Deacon. Up for debate. This is a 6th century engraving on a Roman votive. By the gift of God and of the blessed Apostle Paul, Demetrius, the deacon and controller of the monies of the holy, apostolic, and papal chair, together with Anna the deacon, that's his sister, offered this vow to the blessed Paul. Okay, so the ambiguous nature of this inscription may not be immediately clear. But let me tell you, both Demetrius's and Anna's titles are abbreviated to the four-letter word diac. So there's no feminine or masculine ending or really any ending to the word. Anna could be a deacon or a deaconess. And if she was a deaconess, perhaps that meant that she was just the sister of a deacon. Or perhaps it, she was a deaconess in her own right, but we just can't know for sure. Nonetheless, they both held some sort of title and were important enough to be in doing some sort of vow for the Pope which demonstrates a similar, comparable amount of piety uh, and function within the church. A recognition of their equality in this specific service, regardless of their ordination status. Okay, so we've looked at a very small handful of the sources that we have. Even though there are not that many in general, there are more than like the six that I showed you. However, I think it's important to get a taste of what the different kinds of sources might be, how historians have interpreted these things, because this sort of informs our understanding of whether women were ordained or not. At this point, I'm going to agree with Macy, with Torgerson, Osiek, and Madigan, and many other scholars that women were in fact historically ordained, by a different definition than the definition of ordination used by the Catholic Church today, which is a very important distinction as we already established but women held important roles. There were entire ordination ceremonies for them. There were inscriptions of them that called them the feminine version of uh, priest, deacon, or bishop. There's quite a lot of evidence there, and it might not have been the same everywhere as we talked about the church is heavily localized. However, they existed. Okay, okay, now that we've established that, how did they come to lose that option? How did women get that chance of ordination snatched away from them? Well, as I just said, it might not have been allowed everywhere by every bishop, and clearly it was not a new idea that church fathers did not want women to be ordained from Paul and the Bible onward. So it, it's not a new idea. However, what was new was a new definition of ordination that was coming about around the 11th 12th centuries. This definition was tied mostly to the priesthood and divorced from the laity and any woman. Now, most historians agree that this transformation in the definition of ordination came from the problem that it was hard to get clergy to be celibate. Now, this might 
come as a surprise to many modern Catholics who believe in the constancy of the priests not being able to be married. However, clergymen did used to marry. A lot and their wives were often partners to them. They might have even been ordained themselves. And there are a couple different models for this. They could have had sexual relations and helped run, for example, the bishopric and the, the, herit, um, the inheritance for their children. However, another model of continent spiritual marriage uh, occurred when both parties took vows to remain celibate and even lived separate lives from one another, separate houses, not able to see each other, and they both had pretty prominent roles in the church. So this might be a presbyter and a presbytera. Um, they both had titles, they were both ordained, and they were both looked upon pretty well. They didn't have sex, but they were still married. Given that, there was already this model of clerical marriage that was pretty common and did not have to involve any sort of possibly impure sexual relations. So why get rid of it? Why not allow women to be ordained? Well, both Torgerson and Macy make the argument that this was part of a big ploy to make the laity and the clergy very separate. So no marriage at all, extreme spiritual piety, special powers, to the priesthood specifically that the laity were not allowed to have, such as ordaining others, being ordained, serving at the altar. And why? They wanted to control power. They wanted to control the purse. What better way to make sure that you're different, more special than everyone around you, than by building on the extant literature of the evils of spirituality and the evils of women in particular. Now by the time this change was occurring in earnest, there was already a huge canon of the church fathers who did not like women. Writers like Augustine and Tertullian interpreted biblical passages, particularly from Paul or from the Old Testament, and applied a very Aristotelian lens to them, viewing sexuality as something inherently impure and inherently tied to women. Tertullian, for instance, expanded upon Paul's command that women should not speak in church, writing, a woman is not permitted to speak in church, neither may she teach, baptize, offer, nor claim for herself any function proper to a man, especially the sacerdotal office. Further, as stated before, these church fathers defined women by their sexuality. Unlike her male counterparts, woman was unable to control her sexuality or exist separately from it in an ascetic lifestyle. So she was not able to fulfill that ordained role of the vowed religious continent wife to a priest. Further, she was incapable of becoming a priest at all, let alone serving alongside one. The new canons and synods, some of which we already covered, built upon this extant literature and solidified the concept of the priest as special, separate, powerful, and male. As Macy writes, when theologians set out to prove that presbytery and deaconesses never existed, they found a receptive audience. Now, of course, this is not entirely unique to women. Like instant institutionalization is wont to do, the diversity of orders within the church for everyone, not just women, went down steeply. And the original hierarchy of Christians versus non-Christians became replaced by a newer hierarchy of very, very special Christians and everyone else, including all women. So this is to say that it was not only women who were excluded by this new definition of ordination, by this increasing power of the priesthood, However, they were the most completely affected by it. So to recap, this is a very brief summary of how women lost their ordination rights over time. However, it demonstrates that it was primarily due to a grab for power, the increasing institutionalization of the church, and the easy scapegoat of womanhood that had been there since the beginning. And now the big question, does this have any bearing or any possible impact on the Catholic Church today. Well, what have we learned? Women used to be ordained. It was under a different definition of ordination, but they definitely had that role and underwent ceremonies to make them just as ordained as any male priest or bishop or deacon of the time. We also learned that there is a lot of evidence to suggest that women were not wanted as ordained officials by many church fathers. It was a fight that had been there sort of since the beginning. It's not like it was this magical time of equality between men and women, necessarily, um, or that it was universal in the slightest bit. Third, misogyny and the tying of woman to sexuality and purity and imperfect maleness is 
rooted in the history and texts of the church. It's not something that can be done away with by just saying, oh, women can be priests now, you got it, it's fine. Um, it's not gonna go away unless there's a fundamental shift, not just in the definition of ordination that is used today, but also in, perhaps, the entire foundation of the church itself. So yeah, you could argue that at some point women were ordained in the church. But can this change anything? I don't think so. Uh, it hasn't yet, and as we've seen in many other cases, such as LGBT rights and abortion, the church is not just going to change something because a modern audience wants it to happen. So, unfortunately, yes, perhaps women were priests, and women were definitely other orders. But if you're looking for an answer to what you see as misogyny in the church and bad experiences with it, go look elsewhere.